All right, I'd like to call this March 27th meeting of the Tennessee Fish and Wildlife Commission meeting to order. My name is Jeff Griggs, and I am chairman of the commission. I uh, would like to ask everybody, if you have a cell phone, please put it on vibrate or mute. If you get a phone call, please step outside the room to take your call. Uh, at this time, I'd like to ask everybody to stand. I'd like for Region 2 Manager Tim Cleveland to lead us in our invocation and remain standing as he leads us in a pledge. Tim. Thank you, let, it, let us pray. Father, we're just so thankful for this wonderful day. We're so thankful for the life that you've given us and we, we do not take it for granted. Thank you, Father, for these resources in this great state and we thank you for the sportsmen and, and the people of the, of the great state of Tennessee also. And Father, we just ask that as we go through our process that you would give us wisdom and guidance to, to be able to make the right decisions for, for, for all. Father, we, we, we thank you so much for all of your blessings that you've given us, the great big ones and the very, very small ones, like these little blooms out here in this early spring. And just, just give us the eyes to be able to see these things and, uh, and to appreciate them and to give you, give you all thanks because it came from you. And Father, we, just, we thank you for this great nation that you've given us. It is a great nation. We say a special prayer for our military who are abroad protecting this great nation. <clears throat> and we speak protection over them. We pray Psalms 91 over them now. And, and we pray that you would give them the strength to destroy the enemies of this, of this great country. And Father, we just ask that you would bless all of us and be with us, be with our families return us safely home after our endeavors here and and watch over us uh, as as we are all together here and gather us together again in uh, in a month when we can begin this process uh, again and it's in your holy name we pray amen i pledge allegiance to the flag of the united states of america and to the republic for which it stands one nation under god indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Tim. I believe you're fixing to take another tour next week. Is that correct? Yes, I am. I'd like I'll that. be in Bulgaria next week. Oh, you will definitely be in our prayers, and we appreciate you so much. Barbara, at this time, would you call the roll, please? Jim Bledsoe. Here. Harold Cannon. Here. Bill Cox. Here. Jeff Griggs. Here. Connie King. Here. Jeff McMillan. Here. Tom Rice. Here. Jim Ripley. Here. James Stroud. Here. Trey Teague. Here. David Watson. Here. Jamie Woodson. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you, Ms. Barber. I'm sure all of you have had a chance to read the minutes from the February 14th commission meeting. If there are no corrections, I would entertain a motion for approval. So moved. A motion to have a second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion approved the minutes for February 14th passes. Um, at this time, I would like to welcome our newest member to the commission, uh, Miss Connie King. Connie is married to David King. They own the Mid-South Shooters uh, Supply in Clarksville. She has two grown daughters, six grandchildren. She's an avid fisherman and loves to wing shoot and uh, she will be representing District 6. Ms. Connie, we welcome you. Thank you so much. Uh, before I go to Director Carter, uh, Commissioner Cannon, would you give us an update on Moment of Freedom? Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, tomorrow night at the festivities for the governor's one shot, we'll have our first blind uh, delivered. Uh, that is wheelchair accessible. Uh, Shane Hall has gone to pick that up today and we're pretty excited it's gonna be there. We have raised funds uh, right now to cover the cost of three blinds plus uh, compensation for the Varner track. We're right at $13,000. Uh, we're about three, th three to $4,000 away from reaching the goal and Shane is, is confident that we'll, we'll achieve that. From commissioners, personally I wanna thank you all 
within this commission we've had eight thousand dollars raised and uh dr mcmillan's challenge uh you all embraced so thank you all so very very much uh we have some momentum and his information the blind that is being delivered uh for tomorrow night's uh gathering the next weekend is going to be used for one of our wounded warriors as part of a turkey hunt so some good things are already starting to happen thanks sir thank you mr cannon uh director carter do you have any announcements for us yes sir i could if this is the appropriate time to do it i'd like to just bring you up to date on a couple of things that have happened recently one on the mitigation hatcheries and other on some of our lifetime licenses that we've talked about before is it's a if your permission i'll just go ahead and do that now but about a week and a half ago i was asked to to go to washington and testify on behalf of the states uh, at a congressional hearing on hatcheries and the u.s fish and wildlife services had kind of a a change in where they've been going for the last several years in terms of especially in, in recreational fishing and then also in mitigation hatcheries which tennessee has two one being Irwin and the other dale hollow and they're both slated to be closed at some point or at least scale back because of federal funding issues so the congress held the, the hearing uh congressman Rowe from uh, up near Com commissioner mcmillan's area up there uh, testified before I did and talked about the necessity of the hatcheries and the economic driver behind them, the recreational opportunities that they have. And I was able to do the same thing. Uh, my feeling was that, that Congress really wants something changed. I think they're even open to possible legislation that would point out to the Fish and Wildlife Service that it is part of their responsibility to keep hatcheries op operational and that recreation is a big part of that. So we're a long way from being there, but we're, we're good on the two that we have in Tennessee through fiscal year 15. So we got until October the 1st of 2015 to find out exactly where we are, but I was encouraged by that. The other thing, they met with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service representatives, the chief of their, their division of federal aid about our lifetime licenses, and specifically the one on senior citizen license. Again, I don't have anything I can tell you that's going to happen, but I was very encouraged by, by the, the feedback that we got from the fellow who is the, the chief of that division. That, that he agreed that, that probably where we are is not uh, in the best interest of either Tennessee or the Fish and Wildlife Service and moving forward that they feel like if they, their audits had said things were fine in the past that they probably ought to stick with that. But he's got a couple of things he has to do and has to go through the, the director of the Fish and Wildlife Service for a change. But informed him about what the legislative action was going on and the fact that we had a resolution going through the legislature, told him about what the, the governor's feedback had been and so forth. And, and they're, I think they're interested in helping us. I, I wish I could tell you here's exactly what's going to happen, but I'll just leave it by saying that I was really encouraged by both of those on the hatcheries and, and the lifetime licenses as well. Thank you. Okay, before we get into the agenda, at this time there's a tablet that will be passed around the room, uh, and then I'd like to ask for you, if you're here visiting today, be sure and, and sign that, uh, that sheet. Also, anyone that's here today that wants to address the commission, you may do so at the time the subject matter is being discussed. Uh, if you want to, uh, to come and talk, raise your hand, be recognized by that chairperson and direct your questions to that chairperson. If you're here representing a group, also mention the group that you're representing too. If you're here and the subject matter is not on the agenda today, wait till the end of the program when I ask for other business and raise your hand in and you will be recognized. At this time, I would like to ask Barry Sumner's assistant director to come up and give us an update on the strategic plan. Mr. Chairman, I won't fill in for Barry. Barry's father's had a sudden illness. Barry's out with him, with him for probably the next several days, if not longer. But anyway, to uh, talk about the strategic plan just briefly or as much depth as you want to go into. You know, we sent out the strategic plan some months ago for public comment. Some of the those changes were made. We brought that back to you all, gave it to you for your consideration. And we're to the point now that we're asking if the strategic plans at a point that you would feel comfortable with us going forward with the next steps, which is begin to implement a strategic plan at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which is mandated so that we not only are eligible for our federal funding, but also gives us a path forward that's pretty clear that where we need to go in different areas. I just want to make a couple of comments. One is I've seen some comments in, in different media about the strategic plan. A lot of them start out, TWRA has new direction. 
in the plan that's kind of true in the in the the way the plan is written in the past it's always been species oriented and the plan was developed around any number of species and then the plan was the background plan was developed from that what we did this year was to take the plan and, and look at a to use the cliche at a 30,000 to 50,000 foot level looking down on, on the habitat in Tennessee and that's what the plan is based on rather than species <clears throat> some of the confusion that's come out I think is that there are no species options written into the plan and no no plans and I just want to clear that up the, the plan looks at the habitat because all wildlife in one way or another is associated with a particular kind of habitat that it has we instituted a couple of things in the plan that we've never done before those being the one that we're looking at subterranean stuff there's a section on caves there's also a section on multiple use that had not been addressed before and we felt both of those were important especially in terms of endangered species and those people in the public who want to utilize TWRA managed lands for things other than just hunting and fishing so those things were built in but there are also operational plans and those operational plans will be addressed a little bit later in the in the agenda but part of those operational plans deal with species specific they're plans for deer plans for quail all the, those things are already written and they'll be modified as we go forward based on the plan but there are also, there are individual plans for species already out of those species plans operational plans will tell us what exactly what we're going to do on a year-to-year -year basis and will help us build our budget around that so that when we get this, those operational plans together we know what it's going to cost on the wildlife management area or at least what we're going to project it will cost and what will the other changes that we anticipate so that builds our budget and that's what is all built into the plan I also want to mention the financial side of the plan we mentioned in the plan about things that we're going to do in retention and recruitment things that we're going to try to do to build long-term funding for the agency those aren't very specific and that's because there's really three different groups that, that are working on long-range funding for not only for the agency but also for the Department of Forestry and for state parks what it would do is look at a different funding mechanism other than just licenses it uh, it would bring in a, a whole group of different focus groups of different people to look at what those ought to be what that amount of money should be and then how the best way to capture that it's a long-term process and the other states that have done it from the time that they start until the time that they finally get where they're going it's about 10 years for us we're already about three years into that so we're, we're thinking three to five years before actual things would change to actually implement what would be done in long-term funding we would hope for quicker than that but if anything that goes forward that would require legislative action some of those things are tied to specific dates that can't happen in a single year so a group that's uh, made up kind of a headline by, by one or two people in the agency and also from the different non-governmental organizations have been meeting literally for about two years they have a plan outlined in terms of where they would like to go how they'd like to build a constituency so the financial part of the plan is really off to the side we're going to do what we can inside the plan through our information education division and the other parts of the agency that work like hunter education boating education all of those to make sure that we have a, the people that we serve would not only have the chance to become a part of that the, the plan going forward but that we meet the everyday goals as well so just to make sure to, to recap I guess on all that the strategic plan is, is a very high altitude look at what we're going to do it's, it's based on habitat there is operational plans that accompany each one of those there are specific specific species plans that also accompany that the financial side of it while it's somewhat in the plan the bigger part of that is off to the side and not really a part of the strategic plan so with a, with that what we would be asking today if if you're comfortable with that explanation or any other changes that you need to make we would ask you to take a formal action to to say that that we can move forward with the strategic plan is there any questions from the Commission I move approval of the strategic plan okay second. have a second is there any discussion from the Commission or anybody in the audience if not all those in favor say aye, aye. opposed Scar, do you have permission to move ahead it passes thank you mr chairman You're welcome. all right at this time um i would like to go to commissioner jamie woodson she is our chairperson for the wildlife management committee thank you mr chairman i'd like to recognize brant miller to share information about the arbor day foundation award please 
Thank you, Commissioner, and uh, thank you to the Commission for letting us talk about our West Tennessee um, Forest Restoration Program and get the PowerPoint up here. I'm going to do a short presentation. Let's see here. Okay. Yes, thanks for letting us talk. Whoops. Got us talk a, a little bit about our bottomland hardwood restoration program and also about the Arbor Day Foundation award that the agency is receiving for this program. And I'm a staff wildlife forester with TWA. I'm over the forestry program and work out of the wildlife and forestry division here in Nashville. We have foresters around the state, including West Tennessee and technicians as well. And just a little brief uh, introduction about Arbor Day Foundation. They're out of Nebraska, and they have a lot of great programs for trees and forest. And uh, Tree City USA is one that you may have heard of. And they also grant, uh, well, they also award several awards uh, every year nationally for different programs and projects that are making major impacts on trees and forests. So, uh, this Forest Lands Leadership Award that we are receiving is given to an individual or organization whose outstanding work provides leadership in advancing, got to keep my hand off this thing, uh, leadership in advancing sustainable forestry efforts on public uh, forest land. And the work needs to focus on sustainable forestry uh, and as well as demonstrate initiative and leadership in sustainable forest programs. It has to be a model for others to emulate and address high need areas. And, and you'll see in the following that we are doing all these things in, in our program in West Tennessee. And uh, we have been partners with the Arbor Day Foundation since 2010 when we did our first request for a grant to help fund uh, the purchase of seedlings to restore these areas. And uh, every year since we've requested uh, grant and have received grant funding through them and so f since 2010 we've received $108,000 in grants which has allowed us to buy 275,000 seedlings and plant 970 acres so it's been a great partnership with Arbor Day Foundation and uh, here's a quick view of the acres we've planted over these years we actually first started the current program by hiring a forester who we'll introduce later in 2002 or 2000 and we started planting the trees in 2000 and since then we've planted over 7,500 acres restoring bottomland hardwood forest in, in West Tennessee on former agricultural lands and this e equates to 3.3 million seedlings planted and they're growing fast this is just one of many areas, the Black Swamp uh, in West Tennessee that you can see where it was planted in 2003, just on a muddy field, uh, former field, and, and since then it's just con consistently been growing uh, until now. It's actually, this is a couple years old, the last photo, but it's, you can look at it and see a forest now. And we actually did our first thinning of the area this year, our guys out there thinned a number of acres there just because it needed to be opened up a little bit and that's what we do once the stands get bigger. And uh, this shows you uh, how it lays on the ground in areas. It's really kind of small but these are areas from the beginning till now where we've planted and you can kind of see a pattern along the Mississippi Alluvial Valley where we've tried to actually the purpose of this is to create habitat for wildlife and to restore <coughs> wetlands functions and also uh, to create a corridor by connecting fragmented areas of forest into one corridor for wildlife to be able to live and uh, fl fly and, and be fed. And a large part of our seedlings that we plant are oak species that we grow from seed. And um, Tennessee Nursery grows them to seedlings. So, so we provide a lot of mast once these trees uh, mature. And they're actually starting to provide mass already some of them. And again, this cr uh, creates, uh, provides critical habitat for game and non-game species that 
otherwise would not have this bottomland hardwood habitat which they need. Some are in need of management species. And I want to also emphasize that this takes a great amount of teamwork. We rely on Region 1 folks to help us, especially in the critical times of the year when we're getting seedlings in from the nursery, have to unload many thousands of seedlings into the cooler and then get them out into the field. And you can see in this picture, they're out there planting the trees. We contract folks to do that in our regional and, and forestry folks get out there and make sure it's done right. And uh, so it's a big operation and we appreciate that teamwork. And we couldn't also do it without great seedlings from the East Tennessee Nursery, which is run by the Tennessee Division of Forestry. And uh, we'll be hearing a little bit from David Arnold here in a few minutes, Assistant State Forester. But here's Damon Hollis, our, one of our foresters, with seedlings at the nursery, very high quality seedlings. And here's some showing just a small amount that we get into our cooler every year. So, uh, and so last but not least, I'd like to recognize um, some of the folks who have been an uh, integral part in getting this program going and keeping it going. And first, um, well, first let me ask you all to rise and I'll say a little bit about you. Uh, Jason Maxidon um, and Josh Emerson and uh, Damon Hollis and Don Lee. And uh, Jason was the first forester we hired for this program in, in 2000, and he's, he got the program going, brought it to where it is today, and, and brought it into a, one of the, the biggest, best examples of this type of program in the country. And um, when he got hired, he hired Thomas Turner, who is not here today, but who's worked ever since with our program, couldn't have done it without him. Uh, Josh is another um, technician, Josh Emerson, who who um, has been working and doing a great job. And Damon Hollis, when, when uh, Jason went to the region a couple years ago, Damon was hired to take over the program and has done an incredible job in continuing uh, where Jason left off. And, uh, and Don is a manager three, works out at Cheatham, but he's over uh, the forestry, foresters over there in uh, West Tennessee, and he makes sure they have all they need and resources and funding and all these things. So. And uh, Jason, Justin Hallett's the last of the folks here. He's not here today either, but he's a other forester who's been helping with the program. So I'm really proud of you guys, and we all are proud of you. And thank you so much for your work, and thank you, commissioners, for your attention. Great. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Does the committee have any questions? I don't really have a question. I would comment. Uh, I'm also an area four director for TACD, the state conservation districts. And uh, Jason come and spoke at our annual meeting up in Cookville, and he's very he is very impressive. I mean, the the program that he puts on, and uh, we're just proud of him. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other questions? Well, congratulations, and to the members of the team, we so value and appreciate the work that you're doing every day. It's obviously making a difference. So, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. And uh, this didn't get on the paper agenda, but we had uh, David Arnold, Assistant State Forester, say a few words about their nursery and their seedling program. Certainly. So, David. Uh, Mr. Arnold, you're recognized. Thank you. I just want to take just a few brief moments. I promise to be brief. The first thing I want to say is thank you to TWRA. TWRA has been and continues to be a tremendous supporter of our reforestation operations through the years. As Brent mentioned, we have provided many of the seedlings that went into the work he described. See Dave McKinney in the office. Dave encourages landowners in his riparian grant program to use our seedlings as well. So thank you, and we want to continue this relationship. We just really value this relationship. For the results that you see, it also brings revenue to our, to our nursery. The other thing I wanted to do here is peddle our seedlings. The people in this audience represent a huge constituency of the conservation uh, community in Tennessee, many of the issues that are addressed can be addressed by planting seedlings. Many of the conservation issues that we face can be addressed by planting seedlings. So I want to make sure that everybody in the audience, and please carry the message back to your partners and constituents, that we do grow seedlings. 
Uh, we like to say they're high quality seedlings as evidenced from the results of the plantings Brant has mentioned. Uh, I'm going to leave some information with Brant. I'm going to have to leave right after I speak. So, so you can go by and visit with Brant and get some information from him. But the two things I want to leave is uh, our current seedling application that just lists the species that we grow. We have multiple hardwood and pine species. We are shutting our season down. That's not to say you can't get seedlings right now, but the amounts and species would be fairly limited. But the other thing I wanted to leave with you and mention is the Division of Forestry is 100 years old today. So we are celebrating that. For most of those 100 years, we have been growing tree seedlings to help Tennessee landowners address their conservation needs, whether that's planting tree seedlings, seedlings for timber, uh, wildlife habitat, an emphasis of ours we're trying to uh, encourage people to do is plant tree seedlings to establish riparian forest buffers for water quality. But the other thing I'm going to leave is just a brief history of our reforestation program that describes our program through the years, the advancements and changes that we have made to our programs. But our goal is to provide high quality seedlings for Tennessee's landowners to meet their tree planting needs. My last comment, two new things that we're doing now. Uh, previously, the smallest unit you could uh, get from us relative to seedling size was 100 seedlings per bag. We have now decreased that to 25, so that's helping people mix and match multiple species. And the other thing is we're kicking and dragging ourselves into the 21st century. July the 1st, you should be able to order up to 25,000 species, uh, 25,000 seedlings online, multiple species. <coughs> So please help me peddle our seedlings, spread the word to whomever you represent. But again, uh, thank you for the support TWRA has given our reforestation program through the years, and we look forward to continuing that relationship. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Arnold. And members of the committee or commission, do you all have any questions or comments? I've got one. Are Commissioner the, Cox. Are the seedlings uh, that we're getting in West Tennessee from acorns that were harvested Yes, the acorns are provided by TWRA personnel. They actually collect them, uh, so they'll be local local seed source, and that's uh, you know that's something that we look at and consider, and it's an element of tree planting success. So, your personnel actually bring acorns to our nursery, and we grow the acorns that they deliver to our nursery. Great. Thank you questions? very much. Thank you very much, Director Carter. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I just want to make a couple of comments. Thanks, David, for coming down to represent the Department of Forestry. That's another one of our big partners. I just want to make a couple of comments. That the, a lot of the lands that they operate are also wildlife management areas. So without their assistance and cooperation, it wouldn't be as much public land for people to operate on. When we have fire problems in some of our, area, our areas, they are the first to jump in and help, and we try to reciprocate. But the, they, that's a part of a big uh, operation for them that, that they make available to us. Uh, just more than anything else I want to say, we have somewhat different goals at times. Our, the wildlife programs, forestry operations is all geared toward wildlife and that's everything that we do. Department of Forestry takes that into account as well. We were one of six states where the, that was recognized where the departments of forestry and wildlife that aren't in the same division were actually operating on a, on a national scale. So we were and it's still ongoing as a part of that. So just want to mention all those things. Jerry Jeter, who's the, the uh, head for the state forester, deputy commissioner of agriculture, and Don Lee and I all graduated together at the University of Tennessee. So we have enough dirt on each other that uh, when we really need something, we can roll that out, and that tends to help a little bit as well. Uh, the other thing that I want to mention is that although we do everything we do is for wildlife in our forestry division, when we have a a salvage cut where timbers died from from either some kind of problem beetles or whatever it happens to be and we have to take that cut into effect and when they go into their forestry management plans and, and we have to have a, a timber cut for whatever reason that money comes back into the to the agency and it, it utilized for our operational programs and it, it's significant in some years so they they pay their own way but, but and when it gets into planning you know I try to look what we're going to do next week. They're looking anywhere from 40 to 80 years in terms of their planning, so they're a little ahead of me in terms of knowing where we're going at times, but I just want to say I appreciate what they do and let you know that we have that great cooperation between the two departments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Director. Excellent. The next we'll move to um, Gray Anderson and Joe Benedict to give us an update on the Mississippi Flyway Council. And I'm reminded that folks who are watching at home aren't as familiar with um, those of us who are speaking as, as we are. And so if we could make sure to 
introduce ourselves and, and kind of what part of uh, this constellation of partners we represent. That'd be great. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, my name is Greg Anderson. I'm the Assistant Chief of uh, Wildlife and Forestry uh, Populations. Uh, uh, represent the agency on the, the Mississippi Flyway Council uh, and Joe Benedict who's going to be up here in a minute represents the agency on the technical committee which are joint committees that work together to set our uh, our state regulations within the context of the international populations that we share with Canada and Mexico and, and all the other states in, in our flyway uh, here today to, to talk about we just hosted the, the technical section uh, and, and Joe uh, did a fantastic job with the help of a bunch of our other agency folks uh, hosting this meeting. Joe's going to give you an update but the thing that we've never done is, is Joe's new to the agency and so I wanted to get up here and, and, and introduce you to Joe and so and Joe joined us in January um, and, uh, and, and joined us as the as our waterfowl and wetlands coordinator. We're, we're kind of seeing where the wetlands part of it goes and so but uh, we're excited to see what we can do with that. Uh, originally from Connecticut, uh, he went to school in Maine at Unity College, uh, Auburn, drug him south, and so he got his master's degree at the University of Auburn, uh, met his wonderful wife who uh, at, at Auburn, and that kept him south, and so which is a wonderful thing. Uh, Joe's been working in Florida for about 15 years uh, before we uh, successfully pulled him into Tennessee. Ten of those years were uh, field work on wetland and waterfowl. Um, another five or so years uh, was as a state waterfowl coordinator for uh, the state of Florida. Uh, we, uh, luckily for us, uh, Joe's wife is quite musical and so had a strong desire to come to Tennessee and so uh, we were able to have a, a, a mutual benefit uh, of Joe having an opportunity to move to Tennessee and also his wife having a strong desire to come to Nashville and, and show her musical talents to the world. Uh, and, and so Joe's uh, joined us recently and has been a fantastic asset uh, and I think will continue to be a fantastic asset. He brings a, a, a wealth of experience, obviously 15 years with another state agency doing this job doesn't leave you uh, with, without a, a wealth of knowledge and, and we're anxious to see what Joe can do for the state of Tennessee and our waterfowl and wetland programs. And with that, I'll, if, if it's okay, with, I'll turn it over to Joe and let him talk to you guys about what happened at the tech, tech meeting. Welcome Mr. Benedict. Thank you, Commissioners. It's great to be here with you this morning. I'm going to open my presentation. As Greg mentioned, uh, we did host the uh, 2014 Winter Flyway meeting here recently in Nashville. <clears throat> so we had um, state and federal uh, biologists and partners from Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Canada, all the way down through Louisiana, Alabama, and Mississippi in our great the great uh, state of Tennessee and, and in Nashville. They had a great time and, um, and it, was, it was great to host them. Um, I just wanted to pull a few tidbits um, out from the meeting um, that we hosted uh, that we thought would be re of relevance to you guys. And so the first thing I wanted to do is um, just remind folks that you we're talking about migratory birds here. And so these are birds that obviously breed in the north, migrate through Tennessee, some might even stay here for the winter, and, and some go farther south. And so as a shared resource, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is ultimately, ultimately responsible for the well-being of these birds. Uh, and again, it's a shared resource. So the whole flyway um, process has been developed um, for states to provide input to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on areas that interest them regarding migratory birds. And so uh, we were able to, at this, at this winter meeting and, a, and at another uh, meeting in the summer, provide input as a state through the flyway system to what's called the Service Regulation Committee. And again, this is just a brief, um, an overview slide that, that shows the annual regulation setting process that's used by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, to make migratory bird uh, regulations. <clears throat> so uh, if you just look at the, at the top bullet there, uh, in January, the Service Regulation Committee, again, which is a, a body comprised of federal employees from the U.S. Uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, they meet and they, um, they come up with some preliminary proposals that the flyaways would then consider. So if they know there's been a disease outbreak, if there's been very little snow in the north, um, they might mention some things. Okay, there, there may be a bad breeding year coming up. You guys consider that. And so then the winter flyway meetings happen. And again, we just hosted that meeting here about a month ago. Uh, the flyway tech section, which is my level, and then the council, which is Gray's level, uh, we meet and we, be, uh, we talk about the issues um, and we, we develop what's called recommendations, probably similar to what you guys do uh, on occasion. Um, and the recommendations then, uh, if you follow the next bullet, in late June um, are, are considered by the Service Regulation Committee. 
And so they, they consider breeding populations, habitat conditions, and again, these reg, uh, recommendations that come from states on various issues. And then for the early season regulations, which are teal seasons and some of the early <laughs> dove seasons and things, um, the summer meeting occurs in July, and then there's proposed early season frameworks or regulations, and then the final regulations are passed after a public comment period. And so I just want to highlight the, um, that we are in this period right here where the, the cursor is. We've just had the, the winter flyway meeting, and we've drafted some recommendations that will be considered by the feds at the SRC meeting in June uh, for final action. So the biggest um, uh, piece of information or, or item that we're working on uh, has to do with uh, blue wing teal. Um, in 2013, in January of 13, a teal assessment was completed, which is a fairly long scientific document that basically showed that there's a lot of blue wing teal breeding out there. And um, some of you may know that blue wing teal migrate very early. In uh, September, they're, they're headed south. And some will come through Tennessee, obviously. Some will stay in Louisiana and Florida. Some will go all the way to Cuba, Central and South America. So they're, they're not typically here during a regular duck season. And so um, over time, the flyways and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service have developed these what's called special seasons to harvest blue wing teal. So the teal assessment that was completed about a year ago, <clears throat> excuse me, basically indicated that teal are under harvested. And again, there's only a short time when these birds are in the states to harvest them. Uh, last year at the winter flyway meeting, um, the recommendation came forward to increase the bag limit of teal from four to six. Um, the, um, following the SRC meeting uh, and, the, and the remaining process there, states with teal only seasons we're allowed to, uh, to actually take the six bird limit. Uh, however, um, due to a glitch or an oversight, we're actually not sure exactly how this happened, but uh, the wood duck and teal season states, which Tennessee is one, Florida and Kentucky are the other two, um, we were not offered the six bird bag limit. Uh, so just in case you guys don't know, the, the bag limit for the early wood duck and teal season is four birds, only two of which can be wood ducks. So what we wanted was an extra two birds that could be wood ducks. Uh, so each of the three states that I mentioned uh, submitted letters to the Fish and Wildlife Service and we basically said, hey folks, did you forget about us? We really want this six bird limit like the other states can have. They said, no, we're not going to give it to you. So <clears throat> last summer at the flyway meeting, the, uh, the service asked states to provide kind of a laundry list of, hey, we, we, we gave you this report, this assessment, there's a lot of teal out there. What other opportunities do you want? You, some states have asked for six. Is there anything else you want? And so Tennessee, Florida, Kentucky, again, asked for six birds in the bag. We, there's no reason not to be able to harvest six teal, even though it's a teal and wood duck season. Um, and we also requested some teal only days, additional days to our five day wood duck season. Um, the teal season in other states, depending on the breeding population, is up to 16 days. So we have a five day season, the other states have 16 days. Now we can't shoot wood ducks, where, whereas other states can't. So we requested um, this, Northern states, again, this is last summer, uh, requested a new season. There's northern states that have never had a teal season uh, because there's other birds that are breeding at that time and they're hard to identify early in the morning, brown ducks, um, so there's some issues with that. But, but the northern states indicated, again, on this laundry list that they would like to have a new teal season, which would be an experimental period uh, to do some evaluation. Um, 